Uh, good morning, everyone. This is Josiah from the parish office uh, coming to you here on Friday, November 4th, 2022. I'm here with my uh, Prince Edward Island mug of coffee and ready to talk with you uh, today about Richard Hooker and particularly about a section from his wonderful work, The Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity, that we've been looking at uh, in our adult ed. And today we're going to look at a part that I think, a passage that I think is really wonderful and really helpful for us as Christians. Actually, uh, Richard Hooker died uh, 422 years ago this week. He died on November 2nd of the year 1600. And so because of that, um, there is this little book called the the, uh, Book of Lesser Feasts and Fasts. And uh, there's a prayer actually here in which we ask God uh, to raise up Uh, Men like, people like Richard Hooker, who will uh, lead us uh, in uh, the truth of what it is that he talked uh, in terms of being faithful witnesses. So let's uh, let's pray together um, for that. Uh, Let us pray. O God, who hast enlightened thy church by the teaching of thy servant Richard Hooker, enrich us evermore, we beseech thee with thy heavenly grace. And raise up faithful witnesses who by their life and doctrine will set forth the truth of thy salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And actually, as we come to think uh, about this today, uh, uh, this passage from Hooker, this is uh, one that was actually a little difficult for me to even come to the point of recording this video because I wanted to do it justice, and I'm not sure I am going to do it justice, Um, but uh, at least we'll we'll give it uh, a go. And I hope I'll encourage you, uh, that if you're interested, to go and read the passage and the section on your own. Essentially, um, in these chapters uh, from Hooker's great work, there are five things that are going to be covered. And I'm going to really blitz through four of them. And we're going to spend most of our time talking about one of them. So remember, in this section, he's dealing with lots of objections uh, from those who uh, object to particular ways in which, um, particularly in the 16th century, uh, there had been um, the Book of Common Prayer had been required to be used by the church. And there were those uh, Puritans who felt like, well, no, uh, this is this is bad and wrong. And and uh, we should have freedom to be able to not use the Book of Common Prayer. Although, um, as C.S. Lewis points out uh, in his uh, great work uh, on um, on 16th century English literature, the type of freedom they're actually arguing for isn't the type of freedom we kind of think about today. Uh, the type of freedom they're interested in is actually saying, well, uh, actually, you should basically do what we want to do, not that it should be a sort of religious freedom uh, the way we uh, think of it um, in the modern 21st century. But uh, remember, uh, Hooker is going through and he is uh, dealing with all of these um, these concerns that people have raised, particularly about uh, the way that the prayer book commends to us prayer. And these um, work on all sorts of different ways. So here are essentially the five things in this section. And I'll go ahead and pull this open a little bit bigger so you can read it. Uh, yeah, I'll even cover up my head there. OK, but there you can read it. Essentially, five things we're going to look at. Um, again, we're going to blitz through four of them. But One of them is there's a line in the Te Deum, which is prayed in morning prayer, that was objected to. When thou hast overcome the sharpness of death, thou didst open the kingdom of heaven for all believers. Actually, I think that's a wonderful line. Um, But the objection that was given to that line was, well, um, how was it that Jesus opened the kingdom of heaven uh, through his, when he had overcome the sharpness of death? Doesn't that sort of lead to this idea of purgatory? Um, The idea that there is this sort of holding cell for people. Essentially, it seems the way the argument went was this. If there was a place like Hades that was sort of a holding place for people prior to um, Jesus' uh, uh, resurrection and ascension, then doesn't that imply then purgatory? And so shouldn't we avoid that idea altogether? That's the first objection that he will deal with. The second was, we pray um, in the litany that we might be preserved from sudden death. And the objection says, well, why should we pray that? Shouldn't Christians always be ready to die? Uh, Then the third uh, objection was, um, we ask things of God and say we're not worthy to ask them. And does that carry with it this idea of servile fear and not the reverence, the confidence and reverent familiarity 
that the children of God have through Christ with their heavenly father. In other words, the objection was, well, gee whiz, you know, uh, uh, when we ask things like, you know, for instance, in the, uh, the prayer of humble access, when we come to communion, Right. Uh, We say things like, we're not worthy so much as gather up the crumbs under thy table. Um, We say, uh, pray things like, uh, there is no health in us. Well, for crying out loud, isn't that just uh, servile fear and not the type of intimacy and love we're supposed to have with God, our Father? The fourth uh, objection, actually, one I'm going to deal with uh, in more detail, and uh, that one is, should we ask God to be defended from all adversity? Very interesting. Um, should we ask God to be defended from all adversity? And then uh, the final one there is, uh, should we really ask God for the salvation of all men? That's something we pray a couple of times through the church year. Um, and the God, actually in the litany as well, we pray specifically that God would have mercy, that God would be pleased to have mercy on, on all men. And shouldn't we not pray that since we know God, um, the scriptures tell us that God is going to judge justly, and it does seem that in that judgment that there is uh, hell, there is judgment in hell, and not everyone will, um, God will not have mercy on all men. There will be some who will be judged. So because of that, that's the case, should we actually ask God for that? Um, And um, here are essentially uh, how uh, Hooker responds to those. And again, I'm going to blitz through uh, four of these. What about that line in the Te Deum um, that uh, after he had overcome the sharpness of death, he opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. And uh, essentially, um, Hooker says, yep, yeah, sure he did. Um, And uh, this is actually um, just a very practical wonderful section where he's saying, yeah, this is the, this is the implication of the gospel. Um, it, he kind of leaves aside the entire argument that the Puritans had made. It, he basically is like, well, I'm going to just leave that aside that maybe this leads to purgatory. He's like, I don't think that does it all. Uh, all, the, all the Te Deum is saying is that we are saved through Jesus. This is just the practical implication of the gospel, that through his death, he opens the kingdom of heaven to believers. He makes it possible for believers to come into his eternal kingdom. That's that, that's what it means. That's what it says. Um, and so there, there's no reason to say, oh, we shouldn't really pray that because it might lead to this other thing. Um, Moger just says, no, I. It, it just is what it says right? It's through Jesus after he has overcome the sharpness of death and in his ascension that he opens the kingdom of heaven so that all those who believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ might be saved. The uh, second objection he deals with is, should we actually pray? This is again in the litany where we pray that we might be delivered from sudden death. Um, And here he makes a, a basic practical application of biblical and pastoral theology. Um, The objection had been, should we really pray that we would be delivered from sudden death? Because isn't it the case that uh, that the Christian ought always be ready to die? Uh, Isn't it the case that the Christian ought always be prepared to die? Because we have confidence through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that in the last judgment that we will come to be with Jesus forever. And Hooker says, yeah, well, uh, but... We also need to take into account that there are practical benefits to having some time. There are practical benefits to avoiding a sudden death, but to to knowing that we have some time. This is a, a grace not only to ourselves, but it's a grace to those around us. That we have time to prepare both in practical matters as well as spiritual matters for our death. And also, we pray that we might avoid sudden death, Hooker says, for the very objection that the Puritans would raise about why we shouldn't pray about it. And he says we should pray about it so that we're aware that it is actually a thing and that we then, therefore, would be ready, that we would be ready to meet Jesus, that we'd be prepared to meet Jesus. But pastorally, Hooker points out, it's just a practical matter that it's better to be, to have a little bit of time to be prepared to set your affairs in order and to be able to set your affairs in order with your family and to be able to have an opportunity if there are things that are troubling you 
to be able to lay those things before God, that that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. And because it's a good thing, it's a thing that therefore God's people can lay before God and ask God for it. Okay. Third, he says, does our prayer contain servile fear? You know, the idea that when we come before God, and we, we do come before God humbly, that perhaps we come before God too humbly, that when we pray things like, we're not so worthy, we're not worthy so much as to gra- gather up the crumbs under thy table, there is no health in us, or there are several other prayers in which we come before God um, uh, in, in, in great humility. Is that just um, a, a spirit of... Um, uh, that is removed from the truth of the gospel, because in the gospel, um, Jesus has restored to us um, a, a, a familiar relationship with God. And Hooker's response, I think, again, is very wise. It, it's basic practical theology that we as human beings need to be constantly reminded of our, sp- our place, our state before God. And that is a place and state of humility. We do come before God. We ought come before God in humility. We, don't, we, we ought not come before God in pride. And actually, Hooker, uh, in this section, very wisely says, if we are coming before God with familiarity, but apart from any humility, then that is, uh, is, a, is a, actually a, a very unwise place to be. That when we come before God, we ought come before him, um, yes, Hooker says, uh, with familiarity. It's good to come before God, understanding God is our Father who loves us, and that we are his beloved children. Um, But if we come before him with a foolish familiarity, as if God is our, our, just our, our great buddy in some way, then Hooker says, well, we've missed something there, too. We need to remember that this one who is our Father is the high and lifted up one. And so basic practical theology, when we're coming before God, we always come before God, yes, with that familiarity, but yes, also with humility. And therefore, the prayer book puts that humility on our lips to remind us, to teach us that we come before God in humility whenever we come before him. And then uh, the fifth one, actually, I'm skipping over the fourth one because we're going to spend a little more time on that one, but the fifth one is, should we pray for the salvation of all men, which is something we pray in the litany. And um, Hooker's uh, response to each of these four, but to this one is also a little more complicated than the answer I'm going to give in summarizing him. But essentially, the answer he gives is, well, yeah, sure we do. It's, this is basic uh, biblical theology. Um, in fact, um, in um, 1 Timothy, and I know I said 2 Timothy there, but actually um, it should be uh, 1 Timothy there on that, uh, on that handout or on the, uh, on the PowerPoint. It's actually 1 Timothy 2. Um, uh, Paul writes, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and is pleasing the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So, Hooker essentially says, well, yeah, look, that 1 Timothy passage says that, yeah, it's it's fine for us to pray in that way. Now, of course, we pray in that way, and he, we're going to explain what prayer is in just a second and how he defines prayer and how he thinks about prayer and how prayer actually, when we offer a desire before God, we actually sometimes can offer a, a prayer or a petition before God, um, even with uh, experiencing or having multiple desires at play in our hearts. But um, we um, can pray for the salvation of all men in light of this passage in First Timothy, not Second Timothy, as that says, in First Timothy, um, in First Timothy two. We can pray this prayer before God because we are actually we we are laying before God this desire, but also laying before God in understanding that actually salvation is in God's hands, that God is actually the one who saves. <clears throat> 
and because God is actually the one who saves, that we bring the petition to him in humility, knowing that he is going to work according to his good will. And therefore, we bring the petition to him, knowing that he is the one who is good, and he's the one who's going to work according to his will. But salvation is found only through Jesus Christ, and salvation is found only in him. Now, of course, bringing this prayer doesn't mean we also don't acknowledge that it seems from the scriptures that God is not going to save all men. No, of course, we we see from the scriptures that it seems God is not going to save all men. It seems that uh, there is going to be um, hell and judgment that awaits some men, some proportion of men that is unknown to us. But even as that is the case, that there is hell and judgment awaiting We still, um, as uh, Paul says here, uh, Paul urges that supplications and prayers and intercessions be made for all people, be made for all men. And so we are commended to lay those prayers before God. Okay, but now we come to uh, what we're going to spend more time thinking about today. It's actually, it's related, I think, to that uh, fifth thing that we uh, uh, just spoke about. And this is the objection that perhaps we should not pray for freedom from all adversity. There are actually several times in the prayer book when we pray for this. Um, We pray for this um, on uh, actually... um, Oops, I missed... uh, Oh, there we go. We actually pray for this on Trinity Sunday when we pray that uh, uh, God would keep us steadfast in the faith and evermore defend us from all adversities who lives and reigns one God, world without end. And then actually to the 22nd Sunday after Trinity, which is not this Sunday, but next Sunday, November 13th, we're going to pray this. Lord, we beseech thee to keep thy household, the church, in continual godliness, that through thy protection it may be free from all adversities and devoutly given to serve thee in good works, to the glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And then also in morning and evening prayer, we also have prayers that don't exactly use the word of delivering us from all adversities, but we pray, um, for instance, in morning prayer, uh, we pray uh, with the fixed colics, um, uh, defend us in this day uh, in the same uh, in thy mighty power, grant this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, right? Right. we, uh, in a collect for peace, we pray, defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies. Right. Um, we pray in evening prayer, defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. The objection here seems to be, yeah, but, but here's the thing, right? Um, is, do we actually have a promise in the Bible that we should be delivered from all adversities. And the objection goes like this. We ought not to ask God in prayer for deliverance in this life from all adversity, because in Scripture there is no promise that we should ever be free, be forever free, from vexations, calamities, and troubles. So essentially, the the argument is, look, I mean, uh, God knows the end from the beginning. Uh, God's going to bring about his good purposes, whatever they are. Those good purposes are going to include adversity. Therefore, we ought not uh, pray for freedom from adversity and freedom from all adversities, particularly because we know they're going to come. And if if we therefore are praying for deliverance from them, we're not actually really trusting God in them, is essentially, I think, what, what the, the crux of the um, objection is. We're, we're not promised we're going to be free from all adversities. And if we're not promised, God doesn't promise us we're going to be free from them, then why ought we pray that we'd be free from them? Essentially, it's this idea of prayer that we only ought pray for the things which are clearly promised. And actually, I think this is an idea of prayer that goes beyond just the 16th century. I think it's an idea of prayer that even continues down to the present day. I mean, why pray for something if it is true that God already knows what's going to happen? Uh, perhaps we should um, not bother since God already knows what's going to happen. Um, therefore, it, it doesn't make sense for us to, to engage in prayer. Um, 
Hooker, in responding to this, he responds in a way that is deeply pastoral and a way that actually integrates what Scripture teaches and what the patristic fathers taught about what the Scriptures teach. In other words, how they understood what the Scriptures say by necessary consequence. He integrates this together in something that I think is um, a deeply pastoral way of thinking about prayer and why we pray and what it is that Christians do when we pray. And in fact, the example of our Savior Jesus in his prayers, which we'll talk about in a moment. But first of all, how do we think about prayer? Um, you know, what is prayer to begin with? Well, prayer to begin with, uh, Hooker says, essentially is, he, he actually defines it a little broadly, right? He says that prayer is essentially, a, it's a disposition of mind. Um, a, a disposition that includes good and holy desires, such as admiring God, blessing God, giving thanks to God, exulting in God's love, and imploring God's mercy. And he, the, to explain this, he says, well, God searches um, the deep groanings of our hearts, the scripture tells us. And so there's a sense in which all of the good desires or the good dispositions that we have are, in a sense, prayers before God. That those things are, in fact, um, uh, are this, even this good that comes from the work of the Spirit in our lives can be understood as prayers. But of course, he also says, okay, that the type of prayer we're talking about here, and particularly this prayer for freedom from adversity, is a petition, right? We're asking God something. So there is also prayer in which we ask God for things. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, you know, particularly uh, in my youth, but I, um, this is one of the ways that the prayer book has taught me to pray, right? Uh, sometimes prayers, our prayers can just seem like a laundry list of petitions, um, right? And one of the ways that the prayer book has actually taught me to pray, I think, is it's taught me that prayer also involves this admiration of God, this blessing of God, this giving thanks to God, exulting in God's love, imploring God's mercy. And of course, um, th there's a lot of good teaching about that out there, you know, that um, prayer involves adoration and confession and thanksgiving and supplication, you know, um, and it's true. Um, it's not only supplication or petition when we pray, but the type of prayer we're talking about in this section, ought we pray for freedom from adversity or ought we pray for deliverance from adversity, is, is talking about a petition in which, Hooker says, we declare to God that uh, what we wish him to do. This presupposes a lack in us of what we pray for. In other words, when we're asking God for something, it's something we are acknowledging as something we don't have. It presupposes a feeling of need. It presupposes an earnest willingness to have our needs supplied. And finally, a declaration before God of our desire to be helped. Right? This is essentially what a petition is. So we, we recognize we need something. Um, we recognize we need someone to help us with that, and then we bring that thing to God because we recognize that God is the one who can actually meet and supply all our needs in and through Christ Jesus. And so we bring the thing to him and ask him about it and ask him to do something about it. Now, Hooker uh, goes on to discuss in this section, he says, well, um, God is only going to be hearing the prayers of those who uh, believe. He says, God does not accept our prayers in this way unless they are connected with our belief in Christ. And he further goes on to note, well, of course, there's, there's, a, there's a difference between what he calls uh, the prayer of faith and the assurance of obtaining that that we pray for. So, you know, the objection that's been given is we only ought to pray about things that, in, in which we have a promise that we're going to receive the thing that we pray for. But uh, Hooker says, okay, well, uh, there have been many times, there are many examples in Scripture, there are many examples of those holy people around us who we know are coming before God in faith, in which they pray or petition something before God, and they don't receive exactly what they asked for. Hooker says, if a prayer, if in prayer both faith and the assurance obtaining what is prayed for were one and the same thing, the not obtaining what is prayed for would be a clear testimony that those who prayed without certainty or obtaining were without faith. 
and that consequently God abhorred their prayer. Is not this an absurd conclusion when we think of how many saints failed to receive the specific requests in their prayers? I was actually taught this very thing. Some of you perhaps were taught this very thing about prayer at one time in your Christian life. I was taught explicitly that um, if a person did not receive, this was not by, just to be clear, this was not by my church growing up. This was in another context. Um, so this was not the teaching of the church I grew up in, but, um, uh, the, the, but it was taught to me uh, in this other context that um, if you did not receive uh, that which you prayed for, it was actually a, a defect in your faith. It actually showed, because you're assured that whatever you pray for, you're going to get, that if you didn't get it, then... Uh, then that's a, that's a defect in you. It's not anything, you know, it's not that God has a better, even a better plan for you, or even a different plan than particularly what you propose. It's just that you didn't pray with enough faith. And Hooker rightly says that's absurd. He rightly says that's, that's, that's absurd. Um, he says there are times in which we come before God and make a request of him, and God in his good will and in his good wishes says to us, no. Or says to us, well, yes, but not yet. Or says to us, well, yes, but not in the way you thought, or not in the way you expected. And Hooker actually gives examples of this. Um, he, he quotes, uh, Hooker it, it gives examples from Scripture uh, from this, but then he also quotes um, from St. Augustine, um, or Augustine says in one of his letters, Our Lord God in anger has granted some impatient men's requests, while on the other hand, out of his favor and goodness, he has not granted some suits of the apostles. Right, so there are times when God, in his wisdom and in his love, will actually give something as a judgment. And there are times when God withholds something in his goodness and his love, and that this is part of God's, um, God's goodness toward his people, that God knows more than we do. Right? Um, and God, because God has a good purpose toward his people, that God is going to act in goodness at all times toward his people. And this, of course, is a very difficult thing for us to consider and think about because there are times when we experience very difficult and hard things. We actually walk through adversities that are awful adversities, very difficult adversities to bear. What Hooker is saying, and I think what Augustine is saying, and in fact what the scriptures say is, yes, there are times when we will walk through those things. It's not wrong for us to pray for de from deliverance for those things, for we're laying those things before God the God who can deliver us, but the God who also is always going to act toward his people in love. And that he has, in fact, a good plan for his people. So that, as Romans tells us, that all things are going to work out for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. That's not just some pie-in-the-sky kind of hope. actually God is at work in the world for good, even when we face adversity. But it's, that doesn't therefore mean it's wrong for us to pray for deliverance from it. Well, why not? Why not? Well, the main objection that was given is we can't pray for, that, uh, for deliverance from things that God hasn't promised. And this leads um, to a very good question. Uh, it's a question that it seems that, that had been going back and forth between um, uh, Thomas Cartwright, who was one of um, uh, Richard Hooker's uh, main opponents, uh, in main uh, qu uh, 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 debate partners, as it were, about these sorts of issues. Cartwright felt very, you know, we, we ought not pray things, he said, um, that were not clearly promised in Scripture. And it, the, the example then that comes up is, okay, what about the Lord Jesus? Because we have an example of adversity that the Lord Jesus was, was facing that he actually prayed for deliverance from. The Lord Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane prayed, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. 
will. And there are essentially three answers that are given that um, Hooker finds lacking in Cartwright. Um, essentially, Cartwright argues um, that, well, it's okay that Jesus argues this way because it was about just, or Jesus prays this way because it was just about one thing he was asking for deliverance from, not all things generally. Um, but Hooker says, well, that's not really very compelling because um, it, we're essentially still praying in a contingent way, right? One way or the other. Uh, even if it's one thing or generally, you're still just praying uh, for, uh, you're laying this thing before God. Um, and so he says, it's not compelling to say it was just one thing as opposed to all. Second, he says, well, then the critics respond by saying, well, we can pray for one thing. If it's that that one thing, um, we don't know God's pleasure about that one thing. And Hooker says, well, um, he says, well, this quite overturns. This is a quote that uh, Hooker says, this quite overturns the other principle that requires that in any faithful prayer, there be a prior assurance it will be granted. So in other words, Jesus makes this, this prayer, Lord, if it's possible, uh, my Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but you will. And the, well, the response is, well, Jesus can pray that because it's about one thing, um, and it, it's this one thing that he doesn't know if it's going to be granted or not. But uh, the response the hooker then gives is, well, yeah, but Jesus doesn't have a promise that he's going to be, that he's not going to go to the cross. So why is Jesus praying about this thing then? This contradicts their previous statement that we can only pray about stuff that's promised. You know, one of the other things that uh, Cartwright said was, well, yeah, Jesus, is, but he's been promised that there is going to be a type of deliverance that's going to be given um, through, uh, you know, through Jesus' death. And that's what Jesus is praying in light of. And Hooker says, right, sure, yeah, but... The problem is there are these general statements given in the scriptures that say things to uh, to Christians and to God's people, like uh, the man whose delight is in the law of God, whatsoever he does, it will prosper. Whatsoever he does, it will prosper. Again, it's this very broad thing. So if it's th this very broad thing, is that a promise then we're always praying in light of, and therefore why can't we pray to be delivered from all adversity? But then the final thing here that... Uh, the final answer that, that uh, Hooker gives is Cartwright sort of suggests, well, you know, maybe when Jesus prayed this, um, Jesus um, wasn't remembering or wasn't really aware of um, the, um, the fullness that he was going to suffer. Um, Hooker says, to say, as our critic Thomas Cartwright does, that he knew not what weight of suffering his, father, his heavenly father had measured out for him is a bit extreme. It is even more extreme to say that while he did not know what was in store for him, he had temporary, temporarily forgotten because of the unspeakable pangs that he was then enduring. The first of these propositions is contrary to the plain words of the holy evangelist who wrote in scripture that Christ knew all that would come upon him. The second is even less credible, if anything can be less credible than what scripture denies. He essentially says, look, I mean, we have here this example Hooker says, of Jesus praying for deliverance from a particular adversity. How is it that Jesus can pray for deliverance from this particular adversity? If Jesus, it seems, can pray for deliverance from adversity, can't God's people then pray for deliverance from, advers from adversity? And Hooker looks at these uh, reasons that Cartwright says, well, that, that doesn't apply to Jesus for these various reasons. He says, well, no, those reasons, that doesn't make sense. Because he says, let's think about who Jesus is. Let's think about what Jesus is like. Let's think about the person of the Lord Jesus. And this is an extended quote. I'm sorry that this is an extended quote. Oh, it goes off the page here a little bit. Let's see if I can bring this back over like this. Is that better? Oh, there we go. Okay, that's better. Uh, let's see if I can make this a little better. Uh, still comes off a little. Sorry. Um, I'll read it anyway. Um, but essentially, what, uh, what Hooker does is he takes the teaching of Scripture that has been understood through the patristic church, the implications of the teaching of Scripture that have been understood through the, the, the teaching of the early church about what God is like and about what Jesus is like. And he says, this has implications for how we pray. Okay. And means that because Jesus prayed for deliverance from adversity, we too can pray for deliverance from adversity. 
That's, that's essentially what he's going to say. Okay, now look here. Uh, this is um, this is a lot, but this is really this is really helpful, I think, and something that's important for us to think about. What's God like? Well, he says, okay, how is it that Jesus, when Jesus offers this desire before God, this this willing desire before God, if it be your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but but you will. How how could Jesus have offered that? Okay, let's look here. The power to will something belongs to the essence and nature of both God and man. The nature of God being unified, there are not separate wills in God, even though the Godhead, Godhead consists of several persons. That's actually something that's been kind of debated in um, modern evangelical theology, modern academic theology in the last hundred years or so. But the perspective of the traditional church on this is what Hooker is saying here that there aren't separate wills in God. In other words, the Son of God from all eternity doesn't actually have a separate will from God the Father, God the Spirit. That there is um, that there is not there are not separate wills in God because will is a property. It belongs to essence and nature. And in the one Godhead there is one essence, one nature in three persons. Okay. Um, and then he says, this is because the power to will is a natural and not a personal property. But he says, on the other hand, in Christ, there are two wills because he has two natures, the nature of God and the nature of man, each of which implies the faculty and power of will. Otherwise, he would not be both God and man. This is the teaching, dear friends, of the, of the ancient councils, which is derived from the Holy Scriptures by necessary consequence. The Scriptures tell us that Jesus is true God. The Scriptures tell us that Jesus is true man. And the Council of Chalcedon says that, G, the, that Jesus, our Savior, is one with God in his divinity and one with us in our humanity. Jesus is both God and man. He's fully God and fully man. He's very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, from whom all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate. He was incarnate. That means he is made fully man in the womb of Mary, his mother. So he says, but because of the fact he is both true God and true man, that means in the one person Christ, in the one person, the God man, there are two wills. The divine will and a human will. Hooker goes on to quote the ancient church. On this issue, the church long ago condemned the monothelites as heretics for holding that Christ had but one will. This was in this, uh, this, uh, the sixth ecumenical council in the seventh century. In the sixth council, it was said that no, uh, one of the the implications of the fact that Jesus is true God and true man means that he has two wills. It's not that he just has the divine will, and it's not that he just has a human will. Now, Jesus, because he is the new Adam, his, his human will is always uh, uh, obedient to the divine will. But he has a human will. and He has a divine will. This is what uh, Hooker goes on to say here. The operations and achievements of our Savior's human will were all subject to the will of God and framed according to God's law. I desire to do thy will, O God, in thy law is written in my heart. In the, uh, so, w what then does this mean for, for Jesus when he prayed that prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane? Well, Hooker goes on to say, as with any man, Christ's will had two sorts of operations. The one was natural or necessary, by which his will desired what is good in itself and avoided all things that are harmful. The other will was rational. So he says, look, Jesus is like any other man in that uh, he has multiple desires at play in his heart, in his will at the same time. His will had, he says, two types of operations. One's the natural thing that's always going to desire for the self what's good in itself, to avoid things that are harmful and are going to hurt us. 
And the other will is the rational will. By it, he and we embrace as good that which the eye of understanding judges to serve the ends that by nature he and we desire. Notice here how closely he is seeing Jesus, right, as being true man, the second Adam, and therefore our example. This is deeply important. This is, this is enormously important as we think about our Christian lives. Jesus actually makes the path for us as as human beings Jesus is our new head he's the he's the new adam right. thus we desire good health for its own sake and medicine for the sake of good health in the same way our reason often leads our will to prefer and choose one good thing over another to leave one thing for the sake of another to forego lesser for higher desires we have within ourselves all the time we experience within ourselves all the time conflicting desires because we're, we're, we are sinners and we still deal and struggle with a sinful nature, sometimes we are struggling with um, the fact that our natural will, in other words, and even our reasonable will, I would say, um, has been corrupted and therefore leads us to, as we are uh, uh, doing the calculus, so to speak, between desires to lead us to do the wrong thing. But sometimes we have conflicting good desires, Human beings can have conflicting good desires. And our rational will is that which can lead us, rightly understood, to choose what is the higher good. And this is what Hooker says our Savior did. Considering these different inclinations of will, it is easy to see how there might grow within Christ desires that seem to be but are not contrary to one another or to the will of God. Well, how so? I'm actually going to make this bigger so that you can read a little better. Um, There we go. We'll make it a little bigger like this. Okay, very good. We'll cover myself right up there. So this is the gist of what he says in terms of how all of this stuff, the fact that Jesus has two wills, but particularly as he's thinking about his human will and praying to the Father in his human will, according to his human will, how it is that Jesus can pray, Lord, take this cup from me, nevertheless not what I will, but you will. So what are the two different conflicting desires there? Well, this is what Hooker says. Concerning death itself, surely nature taught Christ to avoid it. Surely nature taught Christ to avoid it. Concerning death as a means to procure the salvation of the world, his mercy worked within him a complete willingness of mind to accept death. In these two desires, these two prayers, there is no repugnant contradiction. Compare them with the will of God. And if there is any contradiction, it must be only between God's willing of Christ's death and Christ's prayer to be delivered from death. This desire is not really contrary to God's will, for it was the will of God that Christ should suffer the pangs of death, not because he was pleased and delighted by the torment of innocence, but because of the good resulting from Christ's necessary suffering. The death of Christ in itself was not God's purpose. He willed and allowed it to happen so that we might thereby obtain life. In the same manner, the Son of Man willingly endured. I take it to be an error to say that Christ either did not know what he was to suffer or else had forgotten what he had known. The root of this error is an overly cautious view of prayer that holds that it is no legitimate purpose if it does not serve some specific end, which the will seeks and the mind knows it will obtain. Our prayers are, as his were, sometimes merely a presentation of our desire to procure mercy from God's hands. And that actually uh, relates to that other uh, thing we were talking about earlier about what should we pray for the salvation of all men? Well, sometimes we're simply laying before God a desire to procure mercy from God. Um, This is really remarkable what he says. I want you to note just a couple of things that he says here in this section. Um, 
it, he says it's not. A, it, there's not a contradiction within the will of God, uh, or with, within the will of God. Certainly, there's not a contradiction in the will of Jesus, even in His human will, when He comes and offers this prayer. Because He offers the prayer, because He knows death itself is bad and suffering is bad, and therefore He offers the prayer because He desires to to avoid that. But he also desires it with saying, nevertheless, not what I will, but you will be done. In other words, he knows there's a complete willingness to accept death. And there's a complete willingness to accept death because of the joy that's set before him. Um, this is actually a remarkable thing he says here, too. There are many people um, at times uh, sort of have this idea of God, that God um, in, um, in sending uh, Jesus and sending the Son to die, that there is some sort of um, wicked or evil cosmic child abuse or something like that that happens in in the the sending of the Son to die for the sins of the world. But one of the things Hooker points out here is it, it's not that God is delighted by the torment of innocence, but because there is a good that results from Christ's necessary suffering. And and notice here, Jesus is willing to endure it. The death of Christ is is necessary in that it is thereby that we come to eternal life. And Jesus willingly endures. He has multiple desires, right, in his human will even. There are multiple desires in Jesus' human will at play. When he offers that prayer, there's, there is the, the natural human desire to avoid suffering and to avoid death. That's a natural human desire. It's not a bad desire. It's a natural human desire. And yet, Jesus in his rational will says, nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will be done. The human will there is submitted to the divine will. So that then he willingly offers himself. He willingly offers himself for sin. Um, And what he goes on to say here, and this is the, the final slide I have, is that the prayers of the church to be delivered from all adversity are more no more repugnant to any reasonable attitude about death, much less to the blessed patient and meek contentment with which the saints have endured whatever cross or calamity it has pleased God to lay upon them. Then our Lord and Savior's own prayer before his passion was repugnant to his most gracious resolution to die for the sins of the whole world. So what Hooker is saying is, yes, look, right, yeah, we, we are, there's, we don't have a promise that we're going to avoid um, adversity. Jesus didn't have a promise that he was going to uh, avoid um, going to the cross, and yet he can offer that prayer. Lord, if it be thy will, take this from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but thy will be done. And Jesus' prayer, his offering of, his, of this prayer, shows these, this desire that he has. He's offering a desire before God. And yet, he offers that desire in light of the gracious resolution he has, that he's always going to walk with God by faith. Now, Uh, This is really important for us because one of the things that Hooker has done here is he has shown the ways in which what seems like a very esoteric idea, this very esoteric idea, it it can seem perhaps sometimes about how many, you know, how does Jesus' will work? What's going on with the will of Jesus? And does Jesus have one will or two wills? Or I mean, who cares? Well, here's why it matters. It matters because practically speaking, when we have Jesus offering a prayer like that in the Garden of Gethsemane, it, it, it then can be for us as Christians a paradigmatic prayer. Because Jesus is a man like we are and yet without sin. And so when he offers a prayer like that, it gives us a paradigm, an example to show us, yeah, we can offer our prayers against adversity. The prayers that we have of the natural desire of human beings to avoid adversity, to avoid difficulty, and to avoid, in fact, um, death, suffering and death. We can offer those prayers before God, and yet we do so also understanding, yeah, we don't have a promise about that, that we're going to avoid suffering and death, but we have, we, we, we present that good uh, 
desire before God, we lay it before God with an understanding that, yeah, as we lay this before God, we lay it in the hands of our gracious Heavenly Father who's going to do good. And that Jesus himself, when he commends himself, nevertheless, not my will, not, in other words, not this aspect of my desire, but your will be done, that his reasonable desire then to say, I'm going to submit myself to my Father, then is what um, is actualized. That's what Jesus then does. He lays himself before the divine will. And this is an example then for us too. Because we then, when we come before God, we, we offer before God our specific adversities and our general adversities. And Hooker says it's not bad to offer the general adversities before God. We can come and offer, Lord, deliver us from all adversities. Lord, deliver me from this specific adversity. We offer those things before God, but we do so in actual faith. Not saying, oh, well, I can only offer a prayer in faith if I'm assured that I know it's going to happen the way I said. No, we offer in, pray, offer in faith, trusting that God, who's good and who loves us, is actually going to hear our prayer, and he's actually going to do what's good and what's right. And he's actually going to take care of us. Even if we see in this life not exactly what it is that we desire on some level. Even if we, it's not what we desire on some level. Because on some level, Jesus desired, the, the natural level, he desired to avoid suffering and death. And so we too might desire on a natural level that something that we're praying for would be fulfilled the way we think it ought to be. But we're called then when we offer that prayer, we offer that prayer actually in what Hooker would call the reasonable will. Laying before God, God Here's this thing. Please, Lord, do your goodwill and purposes with it, and trusting that God's going to do that. Now, that, of course, I know, leads to all sorts of mysteries when we come and lay those things before God. How is it that God is going to work all things for the good of those who love him? And ultimately, I think one of the things that that invites us to do is to see these things in what I would call an eschatological perspective, in other words, through an end times perspective, or a, a new heavens and new earth perspective is perhaps a better way, a better way to say it. it. It gets actually, you know, we're in the octave of all saints right now, um, and the saints face great adversities, face great suffering and difficulty in their lives, and yet Revelation 7 tells us that the Lamb who's before the throne wipes away all the tears from their eyes. He brings them beside the waters and feeds them himself. And that, friends, is what we pray in light of. We pray in light of this e eternal perspective when we're praying against all adversities, when we're praying against specific adversities. We're praying in light of the fact that Jesus actually cares about us, he cares for his people, and he is going to care for his people. And he's ultimately going to wipe away all tears from our eyes. And in light of that, we then offer, in light of who Jesus is and what Jesus did, we then offer our prayers and petitions before God. Okay, I've gone really long, 53 minutes. Um, so I'm going to draw this to a close. If you have questions about this, I'd be glad to talk with you more about this. But I think that the, this is one of those wonderful examples where we have um, this practical matter. How do we pray that is then influenced by, okay, what does scripture say? And then how has the church understood what scripture has said? Hooker's able to integrate all of that into saying the way the things that we pray against adversities, these are actually good things. It's a good thing for us to pray in this way. And that God, our good God, actually hears our prayers. All right. Thanks so much uh, for listening. And again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. And I'm um, glad to talk to you more about this. God bless you. Have a good day.